When Renault revived its works Formula 1 team ahead of the 2016 Formula 1 season, it had a five-year plan that it expected would put it in a position to fight for the World Championship in 2020. Yet here we are in 2020, and the team has only just celebrated its first podium finish, thanks to Daniel Ricciardo's third place in the Eiffel Grand Prix on its 94th start since coming back. So why has it taken Renault so long to get this far? Let us know your theories for the failure of that plan in the comments below, and if you like what we do, please do subscribe to this channel for regular Formula 1 videos from the race. Year 1, 2016 Renault completed its acquisition of the Endstone-based Lotus team in late 2015. Of course, that team wasn't actually owned by Lotus, it simply carried the name, having previously raced as Renault, even for two years after Renault sold control of the team to new owner Genii Capital. During that spell as actual Renault, it won back-to-back -back world championships in 2005 and 6, achieving something that the first incarnation of the Renault Works team failed to do from 1977 to 1985. During that period, of course, Renault raced against the Tolman team that eventually turned into Benetton and then Renault. Clear? But the team it bought was not in great shape after several years of underachievement. In 2012 and 13, it had won races with Kimi Raikkonen, but slid down the order in the following two seasons. Given how late Renault completed the deal, the 2016 season was always going to be a difficult year, running a car designed by the old team that had to be adjusted to take the Renault rather than the Mercedes engine. So that first season was a write-off. Kevin Magnussen and Jolion Palmer did what they could with an underdeveloped car that was particularly bad over curbs and bumps, which proved to be a grand total of 8 points and 9th in the Constructors' Championship. Magnussen's 7th place in the Russian Grand Prix was the high point. But during that campaign, then Renault F1 Managing Director Cyril Abitabal actually said that its 5-year plan was being accelerated thanks to the investment being ramped up further. Behind the scenes, there was plenty of recruitment with a team expanding from around 400 personnel to 570 by the end of the year, and a push to upgrade the facilities at Endstone, so the future did look bright. But the fact Renault's objective was to beat F1's grandees with a budget that was healthy but not quite as big as Mercedes, Ferrari and Red Bull did suggest it might be set for a rude awakening somewhere down the line. Year 2, 2017 Renault signed Nico Hülkenberg to be its spearhead in 2017, retaining Palmer alongside him. That wasn't the only change, with Abitabal taking over as team principal after the departure of Frederic Vasseur. Later in the season, Renault also brought in Carlos Sainz on loan from Red Bull to replace Palmer for the final four races of the season, ahead of a full campaign in 2018. On track, it was a vast improvement with Hülkenberg's sixth place in the season-ending Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, ensuring Renault beat Toro Rosso and Haas to sixth in the Constructors' Championship. Renault was now able to score consistently, with its high points a quintet of sixth-place finishes. So great was Renault's improvement and its potential that Mercedes team boss Toto Wolff even suggested it could turn the big three into a big four in 2018, given the significant investment being made. Moves such as recruiting Marcin Budkowski as executive director strengthened the technical leadership, as well as ruffling rivals' feathers, given he had worked for the FIA technical department previously. Wolf's prediction was a little premature, as Renault was still battling reliability problems with its engine package that cost it a shot at fifth in the Constructors' Championship, and it struggled to get its new in-house MGUK working reliably, meaning it relied on the old Magneti Morelli developed version throughout the year. But with engine gains a priority, Renault was on a trajectory that might realistically take it into title contention by 2020. Year 3, 2018 Renault partly delivered on Wolf's prediction in 2018 by finishing fourth in the Constructors' Championship, but it was still a long way off bothering the top three. Hülkenberg and Sainz managed one fifth place apiece, with Renault picking up points in all but two races. There were reliability problems and the much-vaunted new MG UK still wasn't ready for the start of testing, and there was a real struggle to keep pace on power unit development over the course of the season, even though it did eventually get that new and improved ERS package working. But Renault was still a dominant force in the midfield battle. Hülkenberg won the unofficial Class B title ahead of Sainz, 
calculated by awarding points based on results without the big three teams, and Renault ended the season on 122 points. But the biggest step the team made during 2018 was the signing of Daniel Ricciardo in a surprise deal after he turned down the chance to remain with Red Bull. He was signed on a two-year deal worth a total of $50 million as a statement of intent of the team's ambitions. But during the German Grand Prix weekend in July of that season, Chief Technical Officer Bob Bell had sounded a warning. Referring to that five-year plan, he said that the growing complexity of F1 meant that five years now has to be seen as a minimum in terms of improving to the point of challenging for the title. Year 4, 2019 Sure enough, Renault's progress came to a shuddering halt in 2019. Abitable's target heading into the season was not to break into the top three, but he didn't just want to hold on to fourth place, but also take what he called a better fourth. Instead, Renault slid to fifth, well behind McLaren and only just ahead of Toro Rosso and Racing Point. Ricardo's arrival served to underline how much work the team still had to do. His debut in Australia was a disaster after losing a front wing when he took to the grass at the start and he admitted that the switch from a front-running, race-winning car to a midfielder was something of a culture shock. At the Bahrain Grand Prix, Renault suffered the ignominy of both cars retiring within a few hundred metres of each other with power unit problems. This was made worse by some bold pronouncements made by Abitable about how upgrades would get Renault back to the front of the midfield. But the package introduced at the French Grand Prix didn't work as hoped and despite again improving its best results with Ricardo and Hülkenberg 4th and 5th at the Italian Grand Prix, the fact that Renault was at its strongest on low downforce tracks revealed its real weakness. Upgrades to the all-important bargeboard area weren't working as hoped and development trailed off, with the team eventually admitting that it was locked into the wrong concept, partly thanks to the decision to go with a loaded outboard front wing design that theoretically created more downforce but was harder to control given the new for 2019 rules designed to mitigate aerodynamic outwash. Changes were made over the winter, with technical director Nick Chester moving on to be replaced by Pat Fry. Dirk De Beer, a key part of the Enstone team's rise in 2012, returned as head of a revamped aero department after stints at Ferrari and Williams. And the aero side was key. What Renault had underestimated was just how advanced the aerodynamic understanding of the big three teams had become given their years of investment and experimentation. As Bob Bell had warned in 2018 before moving out of his full-time job with the team, the aero advantage of the top teams would take longer than expected to eliminate, even if the Renault power unit was much closer to the performance of Mercedes and would move ahead of Ferrari in 2020 after the off-season technical directives kicked in. Year 5, 2020 Renault's car featured a very different Mercedes-inspired nose design when it broke cover and performed with some promise in pre-season testing, but not enough to convince Ricardo to stay on. With the start of the season delayed after the Australian Grand Prix was abandoned, Ricardo decided to sign for McLaren in place of the Ferrari-bound Carlos Sainz in 2021, depriving Renault of its prize asset. But once the season started, things began to look up. A triple upgrade introduced for the Austrian Grand Prix, first planned for deployment over the opening six races of the originally scheduled season, improved performance, but it wasn't until subsequent upgrades and a breakthrough in setup understanding achieved at Silverstone that increased rear grip that Renault emerged as a consistent leader of the midfield pack. At Spa, Ricardo and new teammate Esteban Ocon finished fourth and fifth, which began a run of five weekends where Renault was the second highest point scoring team behind only Mercedes. But the fact that Renault took that first podium at the Nürburgring was significant, given it was a high downforce track where Renault had traditionally struggled, even earlier in 2020, on visits to the Hungaroring and Barcelona. As Abitable said after the race, it proved the Renault RS20 is now a genuine all-rounder, and this means finishing third in the Constructors' Championship is possible if the end of the season goes as well as the middle stages. Year 6 and beyond. The future. Renault initially underestimated the demands of F1, and that five-year plan must now be seen as at least a seven-year plan. With new regulations in 2022, there's a genuine opportunity to jump to the front, especially if the Renault team can prove its aerodynamic understanding is continuing to grow during 2021, when it will use what is basically the same car, but with aero development unrestricted. 
Next year, Renault will be rebranded as Alpine as part of a new Renault corporate strategy. The cost cap will ensure it's not outspent by Mercedes, Ferrari and Red Bull to the same extent, and Fernando Alonso will return for a third stint with the team. There's still a long way to go, but Renault still has the ingredients to get to the front in F1. But it also has a mountain to climb to gain that final 1.5% of performance that it needs to get on terms with Mercedes. So are you convinced? Can Renault, or rather Alpine, hope to break through in F1, or will the factors that have held it back continue to do so in the coming years? Let us know in the comments, and if you enjoyed this look at Renault's long road to the podium, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel if you'd like to see more from the race.